Well, I'm Mark Salvo, formerly of Wildness Guardians, now with Defenders of Wildlife in Washington, D.C. Welcome to our webinar on greater sage grouse and the current planning process today. Uh, our goal is to update conservationists on the latest developments in the sage grouse planning process and invite you and your organization to join the fray this summer in what is certain to be an interesting, challenging, and important moment in sage grouse conservation. So all of you are familiar with sage grouse, so we will only quickly review uh, the basics of the species, the threats, and the current planning landscape. Uh, greater sage grouse occur across most of the West. Gunnison sage grouse, a separate species described in 2000, occurs in southwest Colorado and southeastern Utah. There are two distinct population segments of greater sage grouse marked on this map with two red arrows. The Columbia Basin distinct population segment of greater sage grouse occurs in Washington as those two yellow uh, subpopulations. Uh, they are isolated uh, from other greater sage grouse populations by hundreds of miles. The other arrow in California points to the bi-state or mono basin distinct population segment of greater sage grouse. They are genetically different from greater sage grouse than are Gunnison sage grouse. They are that distinct from the rest of the range-wide uh, uh, distribution of greater sage grouse and will receive separate consideration of the Endangered Species Act for listing. Mono Basin sage grouse are bi-state. Uh, actually, let me start with Gunnison sage grouse. Gunnison sage grouse have been proposed uh, as endangered on the Endangered Species Act with 1.2 million acres of uh, proposed critical habitat. Mono Basin or bi-state uh, sage grouse um, uh, will be considered for listing this year before September 2013. The Columbia Basin and range-wide uh, population of greater sage cows will be considered for listing in fiscal year 2015. Sage grouse are threatened by at least 26 land uses and related effects, including what I refer to as the big three, oil and gas development, livestock grazing, and cheatgrass incursion. Uh, more than 81% of, of greater sage grouse current range is affected by at least one of these threats, most of the range is affected by more than one of these threats. And piling on, climate change is predicted to have deleterious effects on sage grouse and sagebrush steppe. Uh, the most pessimistic scenarios uh, indicate that sagebrush in 50 to 100 years may only exist in those dark, in that dark green band that extends from southwestern and central Wyoming across northern Utah through southern Idaho, northern Nevada, and up into southeastern Oregon. Um, that's problematic for a species that needs large landscapes to persist. Hopefully now what you'll see is a map of sage grouse current range overlaid uh, climate change, predicted climate change effects on sagebrush steppe um, uh, and can appreciate uh, how much this landscape may be reduced from the effects of climate change over the next century. Uh, sage grouse also live in what could be described as a difficult political environment, a landscape. Now this map is a bit dated and some congressional district boundaries have changed, but the political representation within sage grouse range is largely the same. Um, and so it makes for an interesting and sometimes difficult sell on Capitol Hill, the need to conserve uh, greater sage grouse. Now it may be fortunate that much sage grouse remaining habitat is on public lands federal and state, up to 70%, uh, with the Bureau of Land Management managing about half of remaining sagebrush, uh, sage grouse habitat, approximately 60 million acres, um, and their management planning will be key to conservation of the species. Now the Fish and Wildlife Service's finding and listing schedule has spurred an unprecedented federal 
uh, planning process for greater sage grouse. And many federal and state agencies are involved, including the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, not only through their species listing division, but also their refuges uh, division, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and others. Um, our webinar today will chiefly focus on the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service planning process, but you should be aware that there are other federal and state agencies also involved, uh, some heavily involved, in greater sage-grouse conservation planning. Now, fortunately, we know a lot about sage-grouse. We know where they live. Indeed, we know where most sage-grouse live. Their distribution closely conforms to remaining sagebrush step in the American West. We know where sagebrush step will be easiest to maintain due to precipitation and elevation and other uh, predictive factors. And we know what sagebrush step will be easiest to restore given those same criteria. So we actually know a lot about this species. It's a heavily studied game bird um, in the West. And as a result, there, is a, uh, there are many years and much study done on sage grouse. And there's a, a lot of good recent science and conservation recommendations for sage grouse. And you will hear a lot about two reports in particular, the NTT report and the COP report. Now, these reports were developed uh, by federal and state biologists and land managers to help guide the current planning process. Um, now, scientists in the administration cite habitat loss, degradation, and fragmentation as primary factors in the decline of sagegrass populations. And as with any imperiled species, habitat protection and conservation will be key uh, to their recovery. Uh, I would propose, and I think all of our, uh, and, and I think you would agree, uh, that any successful conservation plan has to address three things. One, address and, if necessary, reduce or eliminate harmful land uses in sage grouse habitat. Two, specially protect essential sage grouse habitat as sagebrush reserves. And three, identify areas for restoration to account for and mitigate for wildfire, weed incursion, and the predicted effects of climate change on sage for a step. Um, now, all of this seems fairly basic, and indeed, it is all captured in our sage grouse recovery alternative that many of your organizations endorsed uh, during scoping for the BLM and Forest Service planning process. Uh, uh, feel free to download the 121-page uh, alternative and comments. Uh, read, review, memorize, and share it with your friends and family. Um, it's, a, I think, an important baseline conservation alternative that we can use to measure the BLM's uh, conservation plans for greater sage grouse. Now, before I turn it over to my colleagues uh, to talk about some of the issues in the planning process and how we can work together to promote the strongest conservation possible for sage grouse, and just because I already had the slides already prepared, allow me to address the need for sagebrush reserves for sage grouse, the, the second factor I suggested would be key to successful sage grouse planning. Now, the sagebrush sea is among the least protected landscapes in the American West. There are a couple of national parks that are of minor importance to sage grouse. There are some uh, designated wilderness areas, but most of these areas are grazed. There are some national wildlife refuges, including Sheldon and Hart Mountain National Wildlife Refuges in Nevada and Oregon, respectively, key sage grouse reserves that really ought to be expanded uh, in order to provide greater protection for the species. National monuments, national conservation areas, and national recreation areas all provide varying levels of protection for sage grouse. And of course, they don't 
they're not all covered entirely by sagebrush step. Some of them have uh, more sagebrush habitat than others. The Department of Energy manages uh, sagebrush reserves, namely the Idaho National Laboratory, which does contain some very good sagebrush step. Unfortunately, a goodly amount of it burned a few years ago. So altogether, less than 5% of the sagebrush sea receives some level of federal protection. Again, sometimes that protection can be rather minimal uh, for species and watersheds. Now, if Congress were to designate wilderness study areas in sagebrush steppe, that would uh, significantly increase the uh, current system of sagebrush reserves. And while wilderness study areas are supposed to be managed um, for conservation uh, while they await uh, congressional consideration, we don't include them on our map yet because Congress could just as easily release these areas from future consideration. There are also a number of uh, areas of critical environmental concern on Bureau of Land Management lands in sagebrush steppe um, that could be beneficial to sage grouse depending on how they're managed. And again, not all of these areas are um, uh, 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 sage grouse habitat. They also contain other habitat types and other public values. So I would suggest that, that well, sage grouse as a landscape species require huge tracts of healthy, intact sagebrush steppe to persist. And so it is important that we designate and make permanent additional reserves in sagebrush steppe to serve as a network of refugia for sage grouse and other sagebrush dependent wildlife. The current BLM and Forest Service planning process then provides us an important opportunity to do that. Now, sagebrush reserves are just one planning issue among many that we will um, uh, that will con that we will face this summer as part of the BLM and Forest Service planning process. So now I'm going to turn it to Eric Mulvar of Biodiversity Conservation Alliance to delve more deeply into some issues uh, in sage grouse planning, uh, particularly in, in Wyoming, and the lessons that it can teach us for the range-wide planning process. Eric? Well, thanks, Mark, and it, I don't have any pretty slides for a change, and so if you'd like to leave up that slide of the sage grouse in the snow, we can just have that for a nice wallpaper while uh, you can have my disembodied voice floating in. Done. Um, I will be talking a bit, uh, quite a bit about uh, the state of Wyoming's policy and how it relates to this bigger federal um, process. Now, the state of Wyoming in 2008 under Governor Friedenthal established a core area executive order at a state level, which then was followed up by uh, some instruction memorandums from the State Office of the Bureau of Land Management that closely mirrored the state policies. Now, uh, of course, the basis of the state policy in Wyoming is the designation of core areas. In the federal process, these are known as preliminary priority habitats, and they can also be, be known as reserves and, and, and other names as well. But the basic idea is the idea that you should have core sage-grouse habitats that are, that are protected for the benefit of sage-grouse and then have connections between them. And this, is, this basic premise of the, the state of Wyoming policy is a very sound one and one which the conservationists also concur is the direction that should be uh, pursued in this federal policy arena. However, the state of Wyoming policy has significant weaknesses and loopholes which we would like to close and improve upon in the federal policy so that the sage grouse in these core areas get real protections. Now, in the state, within the state of Wyoming, the sage grouse implementation team and the state interests very much see the state executive order as the ceiling that they would like to see for sage grouse protections. Not one inch further would they like to see the federal government go. And in fact, Bob Budd, who is in charge of the Sage Grouse Implementation Team has gone so far as to call the National Technical Team Report, which is based on science, an extreme alternative that is to be avoided at all costs. And Bob Budd has been going out to other states as well as a sort of missionary for the state of Wyoming policy. It's important to note that the state of Wyoming has done a really good job of selling its core area policy to Ken Salazar and the Bureau of Land Management. So we have a bit of an uphill battle.
to, to tackle here in order to get the BLM to go beyond the Wyoming sage grouse policy. Now let's get down to the, the brass tacks of the Wyoming policy. At the outset, the Wyoming policy was created by a collaborative effort that included and in fact was dominated by extractive industry interests. And the oil and gas industry got to basically carve out any areas that they really wanted to turn to full field development. So what you have left is core areas in Wyoming, which the oil and gas industry didn't want in the first place. And many places that were prime sage grouse habitat and still undeveloped were excluded from core areas in places like the Atlantic Rim, where there was a coal bed methane proposed, and also in the Powder River Basin, where the entire Big George coal bed methane play was excluded. Now, one of the things about the state policy is that it allows the core area boundaries to be revised every five years. And in fact, the state of Wyoming has revert, revised those boundaries. And when industrial projects have been proposed within core areas, instead of applying the core area protections that the state policy uh, applies, instead of getting those applied, the state just moved the boundary line so that these projects now are outside core areas. And some examples are the Whirlwind Wind Energy Project in the Western Red Desert, uh, the Choke Cherry Wind Project south of Rollins, where uh, more than 100,000 acres of core habitat was excluded, and the DKRW Cold Liquids Plant near Medicine Bow and Elk Mountain also was moved uh, outside core area by simply moving the core area boundary. Now, there is nothing in the federal policy that necess necessarily means that the feds have to actually allow those core area boundaries to be moved. I think this is a low-hanging fruit that we may get BLM concurrence on where the BLM says, no, once the state, the core area boundaries are set for federal purposes, they're not going to move. That's going to be a key point that we need to be very active on. Then when you get down to the actual provisions of the Wyoming core area plan that have been applied under the executive order, it is full of loopholes where the plan's stipulations do not match up with what we know from the science about what affects sage grouse. So in other words, uh, what, what you get in the, in the state core area policy is core areas within which you have protective measures that are far too weak based on the science to actually protect the populations. Now in the executive order, it starts with some really promising language. It says, quote, new development or land uses within core population areas should be authorized or conducted only when it can be demonstrated that the, the activity will not cause declines in greater sage grouse populations. That sounds really great. If that were implemented, then no activity that under the best available science would have a negative impact on sage grouse would be allowed. But the devil is in the details, and in the fine print of attachment B, the stipulations that are that are that are defined in, in attachment B are, quote, designed to prevent population declines, and therefore, if those stipulations are, are approved and applied, then by definition, the state will consider that it has prevented population declines, regardless of what the sage-grouse let counts say. So in other words, they have created themselves a, a, a gigantic loophole in which they're not going to follow the best available science. They're going to follow the stipulations that are in this attachment B. Now, what are these stipulations? Well, it starts with um, a 5% disturbance limit. And, uh, of course, recently a study by Steve Kinnick in Idaho showed that 90, uh, I think it was 99% of the sa active sage-grouse leks in the western part of the range were in areas that, where they, that had less than 3% uh, the surface disturbance. So the 5% surface disturbance limit was kind of pulled out of the air, and we know from experience that full field development oil and gas projects like the Atlantic Rim Coal Bed Methane Project and the Continental Divide Wamsutter Natural Gas Project that have led to declines in extirpation of sage grouse leks are right about that 5% disturbance limit. So we know that 5% limit's too high. Next, the state policy allows oil and gas development and other surface disturbance activities to be located as close as 0 0.6 miles of a sage-grouse lek. Now, the Matt Holleran sage-grouse studies from 2005 in the Pinedale area show that even an active natural gas well with no drilling activity but just truck traffic uh, checking the well every few days uh, 
um, will have a negative impact on sage grouse breeding populations at the lek site if that natural gas well is located within 1.9 miles of the lek. So that means that this 0.6 mile no surface occupancy buffer in the state policy is far too small to, protect, to prevent statistically significant declines in lek populations. In addition, sage grouse breed within about three to five miles of the lek in general, so that anything within about five miles of the lek is, should be considered prime breeding habitat or prime nesting habitat for sage grouse if it contains the appropriate sagebrush habitat which means that if you're drilling as close as 0.6 miles, even if that drilling occurs outside the breeding and nesting season, you're gonna be in the middle of prime sage grouse habitat. So that's a real problem there. Now, an additional difficulty with the state's policy is that within the core areas, there is an ability to drill and construct and do surface disturbance in non-habitat within the core area without regard for the impacts that might extend beyond that. So if you are just on the edge of designated nesting habitat, you can put your well site there in the full knowledge that the impacts from noise and surface disturbance and from uh, human traffic and, and from vehicle traffic associated with that well site is going to extend two miles into the adjacent habitat. And yet if you're right on the edge of that occupied habitat, but in non-habitat, you can site that, that well there. That's a difficulty. The ambient noise limits that are, have been applied in the state policy are currently set at about 38 decibels. And a study by Patricelli and others in, in the, the uh, Lander planning area showed that the actual ambient noise level at these, in these areas is more like 21 or 22 decibels. So they're using bad um, kind of baseline information on how loud is the natural environment, and then from there, that allows more noise than the sage grouse can possibly stand without having negative impacts on their population, as shown by the science there. Also, the state policy allows power lines to be sited as close as 0.6 miles from the LEX. Uh, we do know, again, that that area uh, within five miles is the prime nesting habitat, and that power lines provide not only tall structures that are behaviorally avoided by sage grouse, but also perching opportunities for raptors that, that can be utilized even if there are, uh, there are raptor, uh, raptor uh, kind of um, devices placed on those power lines to try and prevent the raptors, they're not 100% effective. So what that does is you have within uh, a couple of miles of those power lines uh, habitat abandonment by the sage grouse. Also, the state policy allows roads to be as close as 0.6 miles to the LEX, and according to the Patricelli studies, there should, all roads should be located at least 0.7 miles away from the LEX in order to prevent noise impacts. Now, one of the fine print difficulties with the state of Wyoming policy is what's called the DDCT, or the Disturbance Density Calculation Tool. And that's how the BLM looks at the density of wells. Now, one of the things that the state of Wyoming put in place that actually does agree with the science is they have a limit of one well pad or mine site per square mile. And that is the, the limit at which sage grouse begin to have a negative impact. So that's a science-based piece of this state policy that actually um, would potentially be um, in accordance with the science. However, under a state policy, it's not one well pad per square mile on a one square mile by one square mile basis. What they do is they use this density disturbance calculation tool to calculate what is the area or denominator which they're going to use to calculate well density. And when you take your project area boundary, you then buffer the project area by a four mile buffer. And any sage grouse lek within core area that is intersected by that four mile buffer then itself gets a four mile buffer. And these combined four mile buffers, which often is an area of 100 square miles or more, is the area which, from which you calculate how many wells per square mile. Now, why is this important? This allows a, a company, say, to put 16 wells per square mile inside core area. If the DDCT area is big enough, 
then that calculation washes out to be less than one well pad per square mile because you're not just counting the 16 wells per square mile within the project area, but you're, con you're counting all of the undeveloped sagebrush habitat that surrounds it for a distance of up to eight miles. So this means that any kind of the, the, the density of development gets watered down as a result of this DDCT. This is a specious argument on the part of the state agencies and the feds when they use it because none of the sage grouse studies that are out there have ever used this DDCT calculation to set the threshold for the density of development that's acceptable to sage grouse. They've all used a per square mile density of well pads. So that's a very important distinction and something that's coming to light more and more as, as we actually implement this. Finally, uh, in terms of the, the effectiveness of the stipulations, there's an escape clause in the uh, state policy. And the state policy states that, quote, exceptions will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, which means that if the Wyoming Game and Fish um, Department says it's okay to violate the standards for core areas, it can go ahead and approve projects that are not consistent with even the weak and inadequate protections that are applied by the state of Wyoming policy. And this has actually been done uh, in the case of the Lost Creek in situ uranium project in which they approved main haul roads that are within half a mile of sage grouse legs that are active, arguing that lo and behold that would be lower impact than placing those outside the two mile buffer which is required by the state policy. So uh, in fact in the few instances we've are, a project is going into sage grouse uh, core habitat and it's not going to get a boundary exception in order to get it out of the core area of habitat, the Game and Fish Department simply applies um, an exception in order to give them a get out of jail free card. Finally, there are some gaps in the state policy that are completely absent that need to be addressed in the federal policy. One of these is that under state policy, grazing is defined as a de minimis activity which means that it, by definition, does not have an impact on sage grouse, even though the Fish and Wildlife Service has clearly articulated that it does. And the state policy provides zero protection and zero stipulations for grazing under this uh, executive order. So there's a big loophole for grazing in this. And secondly, there's no provision for preventing future leasing in sage grouse core areas. Now, in Wyoming alone, there have been more than a million acres of sage grouse core area habitats where leases have been proposed by industry but then deferred by the BLM and pulled out of the lease sale because there are these RMP amendments and the RMP revisions that are underway and they're considering what protection level we should have for sage grouse core areas. If the RMP revisions and amendments do not have a no leasing in core area stipulation, which is not present in the state plan, then all of those million plus acres of sage grouse habitat will be back into the lease sales and they will be leased to the oil and gas industry where right now there are areas that are unleased, which is the, the optimum and, and really the only best thing that the BLM has done so far to actually help the sage grouse in the core area. So it's going to be critically important that the, the plan amendments and the plan revisions that the BLM accepts include these uh, provisions that that there be no leasing of sage grouse core areas and the national technical team report is actually pretty strong on this the state plan in Wyoming again has nothing to say about it and this is going to be a big bone of contention moving forward so that is kind of in a nutshell all of the problems and difficulties with the state of Wyoming core area plan and a bit of a roadmap I guess for us to uh, to try and figure out how that we can implement the national technical team's science-based recommendations as an alternative and push for those at the highest levels. Thanks very much, and I'll pass it on to the next presenter. Great, thanks very much, Eric. Um, you know, I think that there is a real opportunity here at, at 57 million acres in the planning area. This, you know, in terms of land conservation and the administration's second term, this this might be one of the biggest opportunities out there. And, and as our speakers have mentioned, we have a pretty uphill challenge. We're talking about a region that's been severely degraded. Um, the policies that are in place now, I think, are a step in the right direction, but we need to build on them and, and get stronger protections in place um, in order to show that we really have a good regulatory mechanism um, to conserve the grouse. And, and that really is you know, where we have some leverage here. Um, 
you know, we have all of these plans, that um, all public process that we're going to be able to comment on, 100 resource management plans, 20 national forest plans, and then seven major EISs that are going to cover much larger areas. Um, the first of those EISs for um, Colorado is expected out in about 10 days, and so we're going to have our first opportunity. And if all of these plans are amended and amount to enough conservation, that's what it would take to avoid the ESA listing in, in 2015. There are a lot of other things that are going on in the region that also play into this that, that could offer us some, some leverage. But I think the big issue is avoiding the listing. And if you go back and look at some of the, you know, the past quotes, it, it, it does seem like that there's some people who are really running scared. And you know, I, I think it's a little bit of an exaggeration and a little bit of you know, beating up on the Endangered Species Act. But I think it does create a, a, a driver and a reason why there's bipartisan support for this effort right now. Uh, there has been a great deal of politics um, in this region, and you know, basically getting science applied, I'd say, is an uphill challenge. Uh, but there has been a great deal of legal activity. Uh, this is a slide from Advocates for the West that shows all of the BLM resource areas that are currently in litigation. And a lot of this has to do with lack of adequate analysis for oil and gas and for grazing. Um, but it's another point of leverage where the BLM can be encouraged to do more sustainable management and adopt um, final sage-grouse plans that could potentially resolve some of these other, um, other challenges. How do we get the most out of this process? Um, you know, if one example that we can look back to is the roadless area conservation rule of 2001. This was a forest service planning initiative that ended up protecting 58 million acres of the national forest. When, this, when that initiative started out, it was basically a, uh, an effort to reform the management of the road system. But because of the tremendous level of public interest in protecting national forests, um, the fact that we were able to generate such a large amount of comments um, as they started working on a roadless policy, we were able to kind of bump things up and convince the administration that by protecting roadless areas, they could solve multiple problems and also leave a, a really strong conservation legacy. I think we have the same opportunity with the Obama administration, where by improving uh, some of the plans that are out there now, the Wyoming core strategy, uh, moving to like a Wyoming plus strategy that has the 3% disturbance standard that creates the sage grouse, the reserves that Mark talking about, that we actually have an opportunity to, to leave a legacy of sustainably managed landscapes and some new significant protected areas that would benefit a lot more than just um, the greater sage grouse. There's also um, other birds of conservation concern, sage sparrow, brewer sparrow, um, and then a lot of other terrestrial species, mule deer, et cetera. So um, it's a region of the country that has really lacked uh, this kind of scientific conservation, and so it's a, it's a huge opportunity for our community. Um, when we've met with the BLM about this repeatedly, they say that the best thing that we can do to help them and help the administration is to generate a lot of comments. Um, there's a lot of sorting out to do where there's some new science that they need to apply, and so it's very important that we, you know, bring uh, both the, you know, the popular, you know, large numbers of comments, but also the very technical kind of work. And I, I, I want to thank Mark and Eric for some of the, the really detailed analysis that they've been doing. Um, I think that that's another way that we can influence this process is by providing um, Secretary Jewell and others with some very good information on how they can really succeed with this effort. So in order to get organized, um, we're starting to do things like holding this webinar. Um, there's a, now a sage grouse listserv, and if you're not part of the sage grouse listserv, we'd encourage you to sign up. You can do that by sending an email either to myself or to Mark Salvo, and we'd be happy to, to include you there. Um, there are going to be a couple of organizing letters um, circulating very soon. Uh, one is going to be to Secretary Jewell, and it's going to talk about the need to uh, bring the Fish and Wildlife Service and the BLM um, together to come up with a little bit of a stronger game plan to, to complete this process. Um, we do think that, uh, that some leadership here could really make a huge difference because we're seeing a bit of a problem right now where the BLM is moving in different directions in different places. They, they kind of have a history of a very decentralized management, and so this is really an instance where we need to have them do regional management, um, something that they're not really accustomed to doing, and so there's a need for some um, leadership from the secretarial level to help, you know, bring this together. And so we'd like to encourage folks to participate and for your organizations to participate in the comment drives. Um, the first one 
of these EISs is coming out in a few weeks. We'll be using the listserv to get information about how to comment, and we'll be providing templates and sign-on letters for um, other groups to endorse to, to be involved with this. Um, so at this point, I thought we could maybe uh, see if we have any questions. Graham asked where that uh, climate uh, uh, change map uh, was published. It was published in a, a technical uh, conference proceedings uh, in 2005. Nielsen et al. Uh, Nielsen was a professor at Oregon State University. He might still be. And Gary, if you want to email me, I'd be happy to uh, share more information on that. Uh, the persistent, the sagebrush persistent maps are done by Wisdom of the U.S. Forest Service uh, in La Grande, Oregon, and he's done some really great work mapping uh, sagebrush persistence, uh, vulnerability, and restoration possibilities. Back here, where to go? So there's a question about population numbers. Okay. Um, there's a good question from Ed Arnett. Regarding sage grouse population numbers and targets, how many sage grouse is enough? We've asked the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service this, and I've scoured the literature. Um, nobody knows for sure, <laughs> and maybe people are apprehensive about about um, putting a number on it. Um, there were between two and 16 million sage grouse historically. The numbers have been reduced to somewhere between 140 to maybe 400,000 sage grouse today. Um, again, it's a population that, uh, though we can count these birds when they arrive to the lex every spring, the counting uh, is uh, uh, complicated, and we don't know for certain uh, how many sage grouse actually occur. Um, uh, one way, though, to approach the question um, is to ask Western states. How many sage grouse do you want to hunt every year? Because when you ask these state wildlife departments, which have decades of experience setting hunting quotas, they can typically tell you fairly quickly. Um, if you want to hunt, uh, harvest 25,000 birds in a season, then they can tell you you need X number of birds to support uh, that uh, uh, harvest goal. So one way to approach this, and I think it's a, it's it's um, um, attractive to the states uh, and the federal land managers, is to because we all would like to restore sage grouse populations to support an ample harvestable surplus. Um, is to is to phrase the question that way: uh, how many um, how many birds we'd like to harvest, and we'll work backwards from there. Well, then we'll likely have enough sage grouse on the landscape um, uh, for the species persistence. The Grazing Improvement Act, GIA, that my colleague and friend Greta Anderson has posted here. The Grazing Improvement Act um, is legislation introduced by the livestock industry to uh, streamline and entrench livestock grazing on federal public lands. Um, and as uh, Dr. Clay Braun, um, and, well, and I see that Greta has just posted the comment, Dr. Clay Braun, an important sage grouse expert uh, on both greater and guns and sage grouse, commented in his testimony uh, to uh, the relevant House uh, uh, subcommittee uh, passing the Grazing Improvement Act, uh, which further entrenches grazing on public lands, uh, would likely ensure the listing of greater sage grouse under the Endangered Species Act. Okay, there's another posting here um, about the Mono Basin distinct population segment um, or the bi-state distinct population segment of greater sage grouse. There are some dedicated websites that the agencies maintain for the bi-state population, but you can also send me an email and, and um, uh, those who are interested about that, in that distinct population uh, specifically, um, and, and I can provide you some more information. And Steve and I are gonna post our emails on the bulletin board here momentarily. Well, I just wanted to jump in there about the um, state wildlife agencies. They have been very involved with this process. What, what we're seeing is, in a sense, a kind of a state-by-state -state effort where um, each state has been moving forward with, with a separate plan, and 
and they're very um, they're varying quite a bit. The Idaho plan looks like it might have some better features than the uh, the Wyoming plan. Um, the Utah plan looks quite a lot worse. And in fact, the Fish and Wildlife Service sent the state of Utah a letter, you know, explaining to them all of their shortcomings. And um, so that's kind of the process that we're in now, where we need the Fish and Wildlife Service and the BLM leadership to look at each of these disparate efforts and try to bring them together into a more consistent whole. Um, to have an adequate regulatory mechanism, there has to be some consistency in the management framework. And, um, and I just wanted to throw in one other topic, um, which I did mention before. Mark mentioned about the impact of climate change. You know, one of the possibilities out of this process is more sustainable energy development on public land. Um, a lot of grouse habitat has been lost to oil and gas drilling and to coal leasing um, over the last couple of decades, and this process offers an opportunity to do some zoning, to try to steer development to the places um, where it would do the least environmental harm. And just, you know, from a climate perspective, we need to start ratcheting back on, on drilling um, carbon. There's another question here posted regarding uh, livestock grazing. Um, um, the NRCS is heavily involved in uh, a program to improve livestock grazing on private lands uh, in sage grouse range um, that is having some benefit for the species. Um, on public lands, however, uh, probably the best prescription for grazing is to remove livestock uh, from essential sage grouse habitat. Sage grouse steppe did not evolve with a rivery by heavy hooved grazing mammals, and grazing can have deleterious effects on the species. So um, while uh, it's particularly in our country, difficult to tell a private landowner what to do with uh, his or her uh, grazing lands, uh, the NRCS program may be the best that we can do for improving grazing practices uh, in sage grouse habitat. On public lands, I would recommend that um, uh, um, I would recommend that uh, 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 we seek or, or support tools for reducing livestock grazing uh, uh, in essential sage grouse habitat. A question here about NRCS. Um, that federal agency has been doing some really good work and spending a lot of money, over $100 million per year from the Farm Bill, and a lot of that is going to private land um, grazers and they have also been creating some easements. Uh, we had a presentation by their staff last week, and I think they're, they're doing a good job of trying to target um, these projects um, in clusters and key watersheds. Uh, but again, in, in terms of the, the opportunity for public involvement, um, you know, there's going to be all these EISs and public comment periods, and, and the public land process, I think, is really going to be um, what's going to decide the listing ultimately, just because that's where, where most of the grouse are and most of the acres are of the habitat. Um, not to be left behind, western states are uh, separately planning for sage grouse, many of them developing alternatives uh, to submit to the BLM sub-regional EIS that covers their state. Um, none of these plans is perfect. Some of them, especially Utah's, is not very good at all. And you can get information on the different state planning efforts by typically by visiting either the governor's um, uh, 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 website, <laughs> uh, because a lot of these state sage grass planning efforts are, um, are, are, are posted there and the governors are, are, are closely involved with the process, and or the state fish and game website. Um, um, Idaho, Nevada, Oregon, Wyoming, Utah have all produced plans within about the last two years, uh, some of them very recently. So we have another question here, will BLM stop grazing on sage grouse habitat? You know, I think the BLM is, is you know, trying to accommodate all uses, so I think that their hope is to you know, accommodate grazing with the conservation of, of sage grouse. Um, you know, I believe that we're, we do need to see better grazing practices, and some recent studies are showing, for example, the spread of cheatgrass is tied to grazing. So I think as we really start to look at the science, um, I'm hoping that it could lead us to, to more sustainable management. 
when we do talk about sage grouse reserves, you know, those, those would be the places to really focus first about, um, you know, retiring grazing allotments and really doing more to, to stop um, disturbance and, and degradation of those areas. There was one question in the room. Well, I think that that, uh, well, so we have a question here in the room. Yeah, this is Bob Johnson from ABC. Is there any way that Eric's uh, rather concise, uh, crisp analysis of the Wyoming Corps habitat designation uh, problems would be made available to us? Is there any way you get that? A letter? We, uh, American Bird Conservancy and Wild Earth Guardians and BCA wrote a letter to the administration oh, on this, and we have a nice four pager for you. Okay. Yeah, so that analysis is available, and we do have the conservation alternative, which, as Mark mentioned, is a comprehensive 120-page analysis. We're hoping that the BLM will include that um, alternative as they do these EISs, and we're, we've gotten word that the first EIS out of the box may not have it in there, and as some of you NEPA fans know, it's imperative that the agency provide an adequate range of alternatives. And so we're very concerned that they're stepping right out of the box and not doing that. And so um, we're actually going to have something very kind of urgent and immediate to talk with the agency about, which is making sure that they include our conservation alternative in each of these EISs. So um, that's going to probably be the front burner uh, ask that we have as, as this all moves forward. We did pretty good. All righty, well, if that's uh, all we've been on for an hour, thank you so much for your uh, participation. And uh, we Join will be sending out uh, more information on the listserv. You can contact me at uh, sholmer at abcbirds.org, or you can contact Mark at msalvo at defenders.org. And those emails are posted on the screen right now, which we'll leave up for a few more minutes.